Enceladus, a moon of Saturn and the largest known moon in our solar system, has been described as the strangest place we know. This is to some degree a matter of individual opinion, but even so, Enceladus is in fact a very special place, particularly with regard to the search for extraterrestrial life. Enceladus is one of the so-called icy moons of our solar system, orbiting Saturn along with Titan and the Jovian moons Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. They are all classed as water worlds, in that all five are thought to harbour subsurface oceans that could, to varying degrees, potentially host some kind of life. Triton, the largest of Neptune's 13 moons, is sometimes included, and is relatively large as moons go, but it is so poorly studied, and so far away at 2.7 billion miles, that it is usually left out of any practical discussion of exploration, at least for the moment. Titan, a moon of Saturn, has a surface with methane and ethane, lakes and rivers, rocks and mountains, made of water ice, and evaporation, clouds and precipitation. In other words, a hydrological cycle, involving these hydrocarbons. This is attractive in itself, because it looks very much like Earth, except that the average surface temperature on Titan is, is 290 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. But it is hypothesized that Titan has an extensive, relatively warm subsurface of ocean water. All of these moons are very attractive targets for exploration, especially concerning exobiology. But Enceladus is especially so because of its tiger stripes. Enceladus is the sixth largest moon of Saturn, which doesn't sound impressive until you remember that Saturn has 83 moons. It is still rather tiny though, only one tenth the size of Titan, and only one seventh the size of the Earth's moon. But unlike dead moons, Enceladus, although it has been pounded by asteroids, as has every other body in our solar system, has a surface that seems to be relatively fresh and unmarked, at least at its southern pole. This is because it has been continuously resurfaced, why and how is that? Unlike the other icy moons in our solar system, we can get a glimpse of what is underneath the ice crust of Enceladus, which typically ranges from 11 miles to 13.7 miles thick, but may be only 3 miles thick at the South Pole. Drilling through 3 miles of ice on an alien moon, 790 million miles away may not sound like anything resembling a realistic plan, but there is a bonus with Enceladus that wasn't really expected until the first flybys of the Cassini probe in 2005. Cassini completed 22 flybys of Enceladus by 2015, before a planned self-destruction into Saturn in 2017 in order to prevent contamination of potentially habitable moons. One of the last images from Cassini was of Enceladus, as the spacecraft headed towards Saturn's atmosphere. The data from these flybys are still being analysed, but one of the striking discoveries was made immediately which is that Enceladus is periodically spewing jets and curtains or sheets of its subsurface ocean from its south pole into space. Enceladus orbits in the densest part of Saturn's E-ring, the second most outer ring of the ring system, and material from Enceladus' spewing of material is the source of that ring. These jets and curtains of water and organic molecules are coming from the tiger stripes. What are they? Why are they there? And what do they reveal about the interior of Enceladus? These are four stripe-like cracks in the ice crust that occur at the south pole of Enceladus, nearly 181 miles long and pretty evenly spaced at nearly 22 miles apart. They even have names, Damascus, Baghdad, Cairo and Alexandria, after the 1001 Arabian Nights epic collection of stories. At least along some extensive portions of their lengths, these cracks extend all the way down to Enceladus's subsurface ocean and emit material from this ocean a bit like drilling in reverse. These cracks or tiger stripes seem to be unique to Enceladus, and they are only at the South Pole. The ice is significantly thinner at the poles than it is at lower latitudes, and the nature of Enceladus' orbit around Saturn and its gravitational interaction with the moon Dione produce gravitational stresses and heat. At the poles, these stresses can produce cracks where the ice crust is thinnest. 
This could have occurred at either poles, and just happened to occur at the south. These cracks open and close, depending on where in its orbit Enceladus is, hence the periodic emissions of water and other substances. And so, with these geysers and curtains of water and ice particles, we've already been able to glimpse what may lie below. The data from Cassini are large, and are still being analysed long after the craft itself plunged into Saturn. It is all very interesting. Enceladus should be frozen solid. It is so small that it would fit between Los Angeles and San Francisco. And the Saturnian system is so far away that it gets barely one one hundredth of the energy from the Sun that the Earth receives. But it is not frozen solid, and this was a major revelation. There is a heat source from somewhere. Heat means chemical reactions and chemical reactions can possibly allow biology of some kind. Cassini, after releasing the Huygens lander to Titan, made 22 passes by Enceladus, sometimes as close as 16 miles from the surface. It also passed through emissions from the Tiger Stripes three times, and it found some very interesting things. All this is still being analysed, but there are some firm results. The water jets and curtains contain salt water, silica grains, molecular hydrogen, and organic molecules. This tells us that the subsurface ocean is salty, and that Enceladus has a permeable, rocky core, and that the temperature at the core exceeds 200 degrees Fahrenheit, or 90 degrees Celsius. Since heat from gravitational stress isn't likely to account for such a high temperature, it is very likely that there are hydrothermal vents in the core, somewhat like the hydrothermal vents in Earth's oceans. The chemistry going on down there, at the bottom of a six mile deep ocean, is very important, because hydrogen and organic molecules, like carbon dioxide, are metabolised by terrestrial microbes at hydrothermal vents for energy. In addition, the latest analysis from Cassini's Cosmic Dust Analyzer, or CDA, as reported in the October 2nd, 2019 issue of Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, has revealed that molecular precursors of amino acids have been found in Enceladus's cryovolcanic plumes and curtains from the tiger stripes. They have to be coming from the bottom of that ocean. This really is anyone's guess. Certainly, there will be extraterrestrial geology, because geology is just physics in action, and happens everywhere. We have to remember that the whole point of exploration is to learn and understand things for their own sakes, not necessarily ours. We want to know the fundamental workings of the universe. There is a lot going on under the surface, and also on the surface of Enceladus. We'll almost certainly find hydrothermal vents, like the white and black smokers we have discovered at the bottoms of our own oceans. Beyond that, what we also really and obviously want to know is if there is any kind of life down there. However simple it may be doesn't matter. What matters is if there is anything we could call life down there, in those deep, dark depths. After all, our own deep sea vents are loaded with life. And this is all made possible by that metabolic cycle that involves hydrogen and an energy source. We know that amino acid precursors are there. We know that water is there. We know that a source of energy is there. We know that once life gets started, it can and will adapt to an astonishing range of conditions. But it has to get started, and this is something we don't quite yet understand, although we are getting very close. We really need to understand what is happening on Enceladus. After decades of concentrating on planets, we've expanded our exploration of our solar system to the dwarf planets like Pluto and Ceres, and the moons of our major planets. The exploration of these moons, aside from the basic scientific curiosity, has been driven partially by the question we all ask, is there life out there? This is also a source of our focus on Mars, along with the idea that Mars may provide a safe haven in the event that we really mess up Earth. For many years, Mars seemed our best bet for finding life elsewhere in our solar system, with the obvious risk that if we find it there, it will be from terrestrial contamination. Mars is so close, that Mars and Earth have certainly traded pieces of themselves for billions of years. The outer planets of our solar system don't really have that problem. But their problem is that Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are gigantic, and composed largely of volatile gases with a small core under crushing pressures. 
Life may not be impossible on one or more of them, but it is hard to imagine what life will look like, let alone how to detect it. We began to realise that perhaps the moons of these gas giants might actually be better analogues for Earth, and so we began paying more attention to them. We also discovered, in the meantime, that water isn't rare at all in our solar system. And then we discovered that there are many moons out there that are very unlike our own moon, but in fact have lots of liquid water, oceans of it in fact. Europa became a prime target. It still is, especially since observations from the Kepler Space Telescope have suggested that it too may periodically spew thick plumes of water from under its ice crust. But in general, that crust is between 40 miles and 100 miles thick, so getting through will be a very tough engineering task. But its surface is crisscrossed, with fractures, and looks fairly recent in geological terms, which means that the ice crust is being recycled continuously. This in turn means that Europa is active in some way, and Europa is distorting Jupiter's magnetic field by its own magnetosphere, which seems to be caused by some conductive fluid that is likely to be water. An energy source has not been discovered, however. But Enceladus is a kind of astronomical and exobiologist pay dirt. It's farther away, but it's definitely spitting its subsurface ocean and whatever it contains out in space. And the tiger stripes are, practically speaking, permanent, so we can visit them and sample their emissions. The tiger stripes of Enceladus and whatever is underneath them are now our main target. They are right there, waiting for us. <laughs>